Good morning. We'd like to get started. Uh, we've got a very full agenda uh, this morning, so um, uh, we want to go ahead and get started on time. Uh, you can see our agenda. That's pretty loaded up. We've got a lot of speakers and a lot of information that we're going to share. Wanted to announce a couple of quick things at the beginning. One is for today's meeting and going forward, had several requests to take a break after the meeting and then come back for questions and answers. Those of you who would like to leave and submit your questions, Amanda is going to uh, give you a way to do that if you've left and you've got a question that's unanswered uh, so that you can get that to us. And then we'll come back in here and do the full Q&A after that uh, brief break at the end of the meeting. Uh, on October 5th, also, we're going to do a 5.30 community coffee. Uh, a lot of people who ha cannot make the 9 o'clock ones have uh, requested an, at least once or twice a year to go to a later time. So we're going to do that in October at 5.30, get those people that are working during the day who uh, cannot attend the 9 o'clock to be able to come in and give us their uh, input and feedback, and as well as hear updates on our plans going forward. Um, my uh, next topic is the Commercial Architectural Review Board update, which I'm not sure anybody knows what I'm talking about. A couple of you might know about it, but it uh, appeared in a um, fairly recent article in the paper, I believe, about USCB and the review process. And with that, I'd like Amanda to go ahead and move forward. Back in uh, November of 2009, the Sea Pines Company uh, transferred to CSA architectural review rights for portions of uh, the community outside of the gates so that there is a, a organization within CSA that reviews architectural plans that are outside of the gates. For years, that was went by, uh, by the wayside. Uh, the town, after some notification, has more recently provided to people who are planning to build commercial uh, structure or renovate commercial structures in this area, the uh, information that they have to get approval through this commercial architectural review board. And that is in CSA's possession as a right to review. This is the area, and I know this is a very bad graph, but this is kind of the piece that was attached to the assignment of rights. Uh, and I'm just going to step away here. those rights exist. Okay, now we are actually going through the process right now of confirming that those areas are still current in that right. Okay, also when you look at those areas, a lot of those areas are residential. We have no residential review rights, just commercial review rights, okay? So that applies to commercial properties that are located outside of sea pines within a defined zone, and that's the defined zone that we have in our records, and we're just confirming that defi defined zone. And this is just a historical development, you know, right that has existed for a long period of time. And as I said, the uh, uh, Sea Pines Company did not want to have that right anymore, didn't want to exercise it, so they gave it to CSA. And CSA is in possession of that right. These areas are subject to town zoning requirements also. Okay, so we don't supersede any town zoning requirements. Town zoning requirements do prevail. Things like use uh, and the appropriate uh, planning, you still have to go through the town to get all of this information done as well and approval on all of these things. Okay, so what the CARB architectural review rights include is the review of design, materials, location, aesthetics, harmony with the existing structures, color, and other appropriate and reasonable considerations is the phrase that is put in the rights. The existing development CARB approval is needed for signage, uh, additions or changes, building exterior changes, site plan, i.e. footprint changes. 
new or redevelopment CARB approval is needed for building exterior design, materials and colors, site plan, ensure the harmony with existing structures, a signage plan, landscaping plan, and lighting plan. The CARB does not approve property use, density, or other zoning requirements. Okay, current members. I found out when I arrived at CSA that I was a member by designation. Uh, but we are formalizing some uh, uh, processes to get a uh, similar environment here that we have with our other committees and other boards where you have terms and appointments. So currently it's myself, David Henderson, Jake Lee, Tom Hamilton, Jake and Tom are both architects, and Ward Kirby who's an engineer and is very familiar with uh, C Pines and, and most of this information. The objectives that we have for this organization right now is to create a charter, formalize our guidelines. We have no existing architectural guidelines and we need to formalize the guidelines. Formalize the review and approval process, which we have not done. We do review plans and we give feedback right now and we will give approvals uh, upon completion of projects and then establish member appointments and terms so that who's on this, who gets appointed, and who's doing the appointments. In the past, this has just been left up to management, and I don't believe that that's the place it should be. So we're going to change that and uh, get the board more involved in that, whether it's the board, executive committee, or wh whoever uh, wants to put that together, the board will certainly approve that process and the establishment of the appointments and times, terms. Okay. So I wanted to give you that information because some people had seen that, it came up. Uh, where we are with USCB, and this is a lot of words, we're gonna post this on the website, but basically USCB has come to us for design review. We've given them feedback on the design, and currently we have not made any approvals of their design. We have asked them to guide traffic for USCB back to Pope Avenue and not to Greenwood. So we're waiting on their response. So just information for you. Uh, again, they have the right to develop there. That's been approved by town. We're not in the zoning business, but we do have site plan and architectural review rights. Okay. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda. Just a reminder, we're gonna have Q&A at the end. And we, if you will, after we take a brief break, wait till we get the microphones for you and then save your questions for them. Amanda? Thank you, Brett. Good morning, everyone. How are you? So we do have a lengthy agenda, so I will move through this as expeditiously as possible. I'm gonna brief some upcoming events. We have our Artist of Sea Pines event here at the Community Center tonight from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. You can see the wonderful works of art that are um, hanging around you. I encourage you to attend. It's a great event, 5 to 7 tonight. We have our Community Shredding event September 15th from 9 to 11 at the Sea Pines Community Center parking lot. So right out front here, come and have your residential um, quantity item shredded open to Sea Pines property owners. ASPO board meeting on the 22nd at 9. Uh, the Beaufort Memorial Hospital wellness bus is coming by. Um, this facility out in the parking lot on the 26th from 9 until 12. You can get your blood pressure checked. Um, they do a, a, several other screenings as well. So that's um, coming up on the 26th. The CSA board meeting is going to be held on the 27th of September. So I encourage you guys all to attend. That meeting will be here at 3 o'clock. In October, uh, Brett mentioned this special afternoon community coffee at 5.30. We'll, we will not have one at 9 o'clock. It will be at 5.30 in October, um, and that will also be here. Uh, David Henderson will touch on the yard sale and his presentation. Uh, meet the board candidates I will touch on a bit later in my presentation, but that's on October 19th. A flu shot clinic is being held here in the parking lot on October 20th from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock, so I encourage you to attend. If you um, have Medicare, it's free. If you don't have Medicare, it's a $30 charge. You must be 18 or older to participate in the flu shot. Um, you can sign up by calling that number right there, and this information is also posted on our website, our Facebook page, and our mass emails as well. Coming up in November, the bonfire event. David will touch on that a bit later in his presentation, but I encourage you guys all to attend a very fun event. Community coffee November 2nd will be at 9 o'clock, back to its normal scheduled time. 
We have a blood drive on November 3rd from not, excuse me, 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. Um, and you can register at oneblood.org or you can call our offices and we can assist with scheduling appointments. Um, so those, that information is posted on our website, our Facebook page. Uh, it's also on our um, regularly mass scheduled mass emails. So I will also be posting this um, after we conclude this meeting so you guys can have a copy of it. So, next on the agenda for me is exploring a community directory. We have had requests um, to create a community directory, so we're, we're trying to gauge the, the, um, the sort of need for it and the interest in it from the community's perspective. If it's supported, members could opt in to provide a variety of information. Currently, as a membership organization, we are required to produce your the name owned by the property owner in your physical mailing address. If somebody came to CSA and requested that information, we are legally required and bound to produce that. So please keep that in mind. But we do not produce email or phone number or anything outside of that information. There has been requests for people to uh, get that information. So if you'd be interested, we're, we're trying to see if there would be interest for a community directory. You could provide your email or your phone number to be interconnected with your community. So that's something that we're working on right now. Um, if it's uh, supported and if it's the will of the community, access would be uh, provided exclusively to Sea Pines property owners. So something to think about. Uh, so that's something that we're working on currently. Board of Director elections. Up front, as you exit, I have copies of this fun little handout. It goes over some of the information of our upcoming Board of Directors elections for both CSA and for ASPO. Again, those are two separate entities. They have two separate nominating committees, um, but we wanted to, to put this up on the screen. They have formally announced the ASPO and CSA candidates um, for the election. They will, um, the election will be held this year, but these people will, will take office in 2017, as of January. So ASPO, it's Charlie Minor, Mark Griffith, Michael Tucker, Richard Matthews, and then for CSA, Mark Griffith, Charlie Minor, and Michael Tucker. So those are the folks that the nominating committees um, of ASPO and CSA nominated. So how do you nominate by petition, or if you're interested in nominating by petition? Up front, I have two separate documents. This is the CSA nomination by petition form. This is the ASPO nomination by petition form. Um, you must have 50 valid signatures. If you are a CSA, interested in running for CSA, they must be CSA members, of which we all are if, we owe pro uh, if you, you are all, if you own property. If you're an ASPO member, that's optional. So if you're ASPO, you need to fill out the ASPO version of this form, and you must get 50 valid ASPO signatures. So that's a big difference in terms of who can sign the petition, dependent on which one you're interested in running for or interested in running for both. The candidate must be willing and able to serve. Um, both of these forms, um, per the bylaws of each of those independent organizations, are required to be back to the committee by October 1st. The petition forms can be picked up. I have some out here. We have them at the, a, uh, the CSA admin building, and then we also have all this information posted on our website at cpinesliving.com backslash nominate. So that's a really great um, page on our website that has all this information listed. Again, please return completed forms to um, Jeannie Pierce by October 1st, 2016. And then if you have any questions about the process for nominating by petition, you can contact Jeannie at 671-7810. So again, um, right up front, feel free to grab those on your way out. So make your vote count. The ballots will be mailed to property owners on November 1st. If you are an ASPO member, you will get an ASPO ballot. All of C Pines property owners will get a CSA ballot. You get one ASPO ballot per property. Um, you get, for CSA, you get, depending on how many properties you own, you get that many ballots for CSA. So if you own two properties, you would get two CSA ballots, but one ASPO if you're an ASPO member. If you're not an ASPO member, you would not be getting a ballot. Um, so November 1st is when they'll be sent out. They're due back by December 1st. Return the ballots back to the auditor, and we do encourage you to um, participate in this uh, year's election. So here's some follow-up. Uh, Brett mentioned it earlier. If you um, 
need to exit or need to leave once we um, adjourn and, and can't stay for questions for some reason, we do want to hear from you. There's a plethora of different ways to contact us. You can contact us by phone. These are our, um, this is our main number, 671-1343. Um, if you have a dispatch security related question, that's their number there, 671-7170. You can email us, info at csacpines. That email comes directly to me and I push it to any of our management or our staff that needs it, or if it needs to go to a board member, something of that nature, um, we encourage you to reach us by email as well. You can also email our staff directly. You can email our board of directors directly. That information is listed on our website under Contact Us. And then you can always come and see us um, down at the CSA Administration Building at 175 Greenwood Drive. So this big red block right here is there for a really important reason. By a show of hands, um, I was very busy over the weekend um, because of Hurricane Hermine, um, just, just so I can feel better. Show me if you got an email from me, um, CSA, about the hurricane. Fabulous. That's good news. Um, so if you didn't re raise your hand for some reason and we don't have your email address, if you would like us to email you, we really want to be able to reach you. This last week is a good example of that. That storm came on up us, came up on us kind of quickly um, and caused some damages. So we really want to be able to reach you and let you know what's happening within the community. So I encourage you, if you um, have an, a change to your email, or a change to your phone number, please email us, info at csacpines.com, and we'll be happy to, to update your account. We do push out regularly scheduled emails on a variety of different topics, but certainly emergency notifications is, is very, very important to us to make sure we're, we're trying to keep you guys as safe as possible. So that completes my portion of the agenda. I will pass it over to Toby, and Toby will cover his portion. And don't forget to grab those flyers on your way out. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, yes, okay. thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Good morning. Uh, let me start out by saying I'm just going to, I've got a couple things to go over. My comments today are not directed at any particular property owner. Uh, <clears throat> I've, I've, I've been approached over the last month that people thought that I was talking directly to them in the, in the room. I am not. I'm just making some general statements of what's taking place inside the security department. I'm glad to see that everyone survived the storm. Um, not every property owner was quite so fortunate. We have right now uh, 16 homes that we're aware of that received major structural damage either by trees falling on the house or limbs coming through the entire roof of the house. Uh, so not everyone uh, survived uh, with, with no damage. Cleanup is still in the process. I, Please use caution. You got to look at the trees hanging above your property. Uh, I believe 10 vehicles received major damage where trees fell on vehicles during the storm. Um, we sent notifications out to the property owners, but CSA and the security department, it's not our responsibility to notify the community of what's taking place during the storm. Really, the town of Hilton Head, EOC, or your weather, that's where you should really be getting the information. But we are telling you what's going on inside the community. I just want to share some things with you, not only from us, but from the town of Hilton Head, the weather service, told people to stay indoors. Uh, and I want to thank Bo because at one point we had 10 trees down across the road in Sea Pines. It was not small trees, it was stuff that we had to use a front end loader to actually get the tree out of the road. I had property owners calling to complain that they had went to the grocery store and their their groceries defrosted because we didn't get the tree out of the road quick enough. True story. Exactly, exactly what the call was. So if you decide to go to the grocery store in the middle of the tropical storm, you might be delayed. I would not recommend letting your 10-year-old kid walk the dog in the middle of a tropical storm who got lost and scared and ended up at our back gate in the middle of the storm. I'm sorry that the leisure path wasn't clear because we had people that wanted to jog on the leisure path in the middle of the storm. So we, I think we were so fortunate that we had structural damage that no one got hurt during the storm because of, we're, we live in a forest. There was trees falling everywhere. We couldn't get from one location. Tree fell 30 minutes prior to me come this meeting and they're still falling in the, plant, in the plant property. So there is a lot of cleanup that needs to be done. I know that Bo's going to talk about that, but please, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. I know that. The people that I need to talk to is not in attendance here today. Um, 
I'm just making some comments because that's exactly what, what occurred. Uh, at one point, our backup generator at our office malfunctioned, so there was an hour that we could not even receive a call at the security department. Um, and we had no radio communications with our staff on the road, so we were doing everything via c uh, cell phone. But it was busy. Uh, and it, I will be quite honest with you, it was to the point where Bo and I were talking where we were going to have to pull the staff off the road because it was just dangerous for them to be working in the middle with everything coming down. We're on Greenwood Drive, we're moving a tree out of the road, and 30 feet away, another one falls right across the road in the middle of us working. So it was dangerous. So please, uh, use caution. Uh, I think we need a set of rules for those who without common sense. But I, Bo or uh, Brett shot that down. So, uh, <clears throat> um, but we had, we had a lot of, lot of calls, a lot of, lot of people upset, and we, we did the best we could. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to see everyone was safe. Thank you. Uh, contrary to popular belief, at, at the gate, we do not like to see the cars back up more than anyone else because the staff has to deal with the gate. We have 25 property owners, not anyone in the room, 25 property owners that still are refusing to put the property owner decal on the vehicle. You can't show up at the gate and hold up your property owner decal inside your car and get clearance. You're going to stop and we're going to ask you to put your ID out so we can see that you're actually a real property owner. Or you're going to have to call yourself in a pass to get in through the gate. Now we're trying to get people through the gate. I find it hard to believe that we still have 25 property owners who have taken the time to come to CSA to get a decal for their vehicle but will not put it on the car. I do not understand this. It helps us get you through the gate faster. I'm not talking to anyone in the room. Please share this word. Put the decal on the car, please. We literally, oh, I have 25 property owners that we are in the process of calling to say, you know, if you need assistance to put your decal on your car, I will put it on your car for you. We're trying to get through it, people through as fast as we can, and it doesn't help when we have to stop a property owner because they're holding up a decal in the car. And then, please... We have to sell passes at every, every entrance we have, both at the Greenwood gate and at the back gate. So if someone gets in the left lane, we have to sell a pass. Blowing the horn, shouting profanities, and flipping the gate officer off is not going to make it go any faster. And it's a shame. I've I got to tell you, our, our staff up there is, is taking a beating. And, and i got to tell you, it's not from a guest. It's from a property owner on video, screaming and shouting profanities at the security officer who's selling a pass, who is doing their job of what they were told to do. So please, share the word at your POAs. We, we're selling passes. That is the business that we're in. We have to make change, and we're doing it as fast as we can. But I think it's, it's ridiculous that we have someone that, that roll, purposely takes the time to roll down the window to shout a profanity officer that's only doing their job. So... With that, I'll, I'll get away from the gate. Speeding, um, apparently I made a statement at some, some prior community coffees that has been misconstrued, so I want to clarify that today. If you speed in sea pines, you are subject to getting a ticket. That ticket could be in the form of either a warning ticket or it could be in the form of a state ticket that will take you to magistrate's court in Bluffton that you will have to pay a fine if you're found guilty and be subject to a monetary fine and points off your driver's license. There is no program in Sea Pines where property owners get a warning for the first time. If they're nice to the officer, that they get a warning the first time. There is no such rule. It's a simple one. If you speed, you are subject to getting a ticket in Sea Pines. So apparently, if, if I must have said something before that got misunderstood, that is the program. I have people calling who has received a state ticket, and they paid $171.50 for the ticket at Magistrate's Court. It's a simple thing. You don't have to worry about getting a ticket if you don't speed. And there is no rule that says that if you can go up to four miles an hour above the posted speed limit. I'm not authorizing anyone in the community to speed. The speed limits are what they are. Moving on. Wildlife. 
with the storm, uh, with the wind, uh, our snake calls, uh, I think with the, the wind disrupted a lot of animals and now looking for new homes. Be very cautious while you're cleaning up. Uh, the snakes are out, still out. Uh, uh, the, the raccoons, a lot of stuff has been displaced. But more, off, more so for the trapping. We have a, uh, a full-time person that's dedicated to the wildlife in here, but unfortunately all of our security at one point in time is a wildlife officer because the wildlife just didn't work during the daytime. They also crawl in swimming pools at the nighttime as well. So we're all working the wildlife. But if you have a trap and you want to trap your animal, you're responsible for your animal. You cannot set your trap and call CSA to come get the animal out. If you want us to do the wildlife services for you, we're going to use our trap and we're going to bait it and we're going to do everything from our end. So don't go set the trap and then call us and, and get upset that we haven't responded to get an animal out that you trapped. If you're having a problem with an animal, and I'm going to, let me clarify a problem. If a squirrel or raccoon runs across your backyard, that's not an animal problem. If the armadillo is digging underneath your foundation or the raccoon is digging or eating on your furniture or trying to get into your house or is in your trash can, that is an animal problem. That is what we will take care of and we will trap. We are monitoring, mapping all the traps out so that we, whatever we put out, we check on a daily basis. So don't go set your own trap. That's your responsibility. You can work with a private individual that's in the business to collect that animal we will do it for you free of charge. We, won't, we do not charge for the animal uh, services, but we want to use our own equipment, and we want to, there is a form that you're going to be required to sign of what the rules and regulation are as it relates to an animal. Trapped animals, you can't kick the cage. You can't let the kids pull the raccoon out and play with it before we get there. All, this is, uh, it's on the farm. <laughs> it's on the farm for a reason. You can't. You can't harass the animal that's in the cage. You can't shoot it with the BB gun while it's in the cage. So this is, we get, we have to, we've got some issues going on with wildlife, and we need to clear it up. But we're going to provide the services for you, and we will use our equipment. I just bought 20 more cages. So we, we, can, we can cover a lot of animals at one time, and right now I think we have about 20 traps that are out. So please, give us a call uh, with that. Um, trolley. I just want to do a recap, if, man, if you'll click over. Um, we've had a good season. It's been a busy season. I'm glad they're all going home now. Um, <clears throat> but it's been good. Uh, I, Victoria, I will ask you this morning, but we, I don't have the numbers through the end of August, but I do have the numbers through the end of July. Through the end of July, we were about 13,000 daily passes more this year in comparison to last year. Um, the trolley, um, the top section is the vacation season. We kind of considered that the beginning of April through September. We moved 11,000 more people this season in comparison to last year. Overall, from January through the end of September, we moved 26,000 more people on the trolleys. Now, let me clarify, because I, I don't think doctor's here today, so I'll, I'll get away with this one. The number... <laughs> And I mean that in a good way. I'm, I do. I mean, he keeps me honest. The trolley numbers. We have systems on the trolley that counts heads getting on and off. So I can tell you how many people got on at Harbortown, how many people got off at Harbortown. The numbers, when you look at them, um, for instance, when Greg Russell plays, the trolley, we have three trolleys that pull up in Liberty Oak parking lot. They turn the engines off because they're, they complain about the trolleys running, so we turn them off. When people get on the trolley, it doesn't count the people getting on. So when you look at the numbers, it looks kind of skewed that it, there's a variance of like almost 5,800. That's because people get on the trolley or off the trolley when it's not running. But the numbers that we count, these are numbers that are off. These are people just getting off. So yes, I fully believe that we have someone that gets on at the trolley lot, rides to Harbor Town, and comes back on the trolley and gets back off at the trolley lot. One person rode the trolley twice. It's still the same number. So it's, we count people getting off. These are the numbers that I'm giving you. So 26,000 more people this year running the same number to number, month to month, than this year. So it was a good season for the trolleys. Um, they were busy. Uh, we moved a lot of people. I mean, 
Harbor Town, South Beach was the number one and two stops. I mean, we moved almost thou several thousand more to South Beach than we did have in the previous year. Uh, so it was a good season. We didn't have any, no injuries, no nothing major occurred with the trolleys. Uh, I think if you take the overall number, which do I have that? Uh, yeah, 119,000 uh, is what we're saying of people that actually got off of a trolley. Let's just say you divide that in half. That's still a large number of people that were moving around on the trolleys that's not driving a car looking for a parking space inside the, uh, inside the development. So it was good. They're, they're, they're busy. Uh, our season continues right now. It, the, the, the season has ended as of Monday. Um, the trolleys are no longer running inside the plantation. The only thing we're running now is just our private charters, our weddings, our special events that we have scheduled throughout the remaining of the year. So it's been a, it's been a good year. It's been busy. Uh, we have had one burglary since the last meeting that we've had. Uh, it was an absentee property owner, so our length of when this actually occurred is a little over a month. So we're un really unsure of when the burglary actually took place. There's not any other major incidents that, uh, that are going on. But one thing that I'll, I'll finish up because I know I've probably gone over my time. Sorry, man. If you, we're a large community and everyone lives in their own, whether you're in a condo or you're a standalone structure, and you know your neighbors. If you have a neighbor that's, and we're, we're all aging, you know, some quicker than others, but we're all aging. If you've got someone that is in need of assistance that, that they're not, it gets to the point where they're not able to take care of themselves, give us a call and let us go out there. There is some programs that are available uh, for these people. Um, people think of sea pines and that we don't have people that are in need. That's, that's not the case. We have people that are in need inside of sea pines. But if you've got a neighbor that is getting to the point where they need, they, they're having trouble taking care of daily necessities, please give us a call and let us, let us uh, intervene if we need to. Okay, thank you so much. Good morning. Go ahead, the next one. Last year's property owner survey revealed, or perhaps confirmed, that the Greenwood Gate is an issue. Of the four potential initiatives that were identified in the survey, improvements to the Greenwood Gate were ranked the highest. In fact, almost 68% of those that responded to the survey stated that improving the Greenwood Gate was either very important or extremely important. While this information is important and it's useful, it is not by itself actionable. So we need additional information to determine if and how and where action can be taken to improve the functionality of the gate. At last month's community meeting, this meeting, a question was asked on what actions were being taken to address the gate issue. And I reported that we were about to begin a visitor survey at the Greenwood Gate, and I'm gonna briefly describe that now. So we, Amanda and I, working with USCB, designed a survey that was administered to people that were entering the Greenwood Gate, both in the right lane and in the left lane. The survey began on August 5th and completed this Monday. So the survey is done. The way the, the survey was administered is that when you pulled up to the gate and stopped, and that was either to purchase a daily pass or to ask for information or to get turned around, these were people that needed to stop, primarily to purchase a daily pass, but there were some other reasons why people would stop. Both in the right lane, the officer would issue you this business card that had a QR code and a link to a survey. If you pulled into the red lane and stopped, you got a red card that had this, uh, a different link and a different uh, QR code. The only difference between the two surveys is that the red or the left lane survey asked one additional question, which is essentially, how did you choose the left lane? <laughs> I would, I would like to thank Toby and his staff because you know we, we timed this because we wanted the folks that we wanted to ask, which were these daily visitors, you know, we wanted to get this now because the numbers, even during the, the last month, really started tailing off as the season began to end. 
we'll talk a little bit here at, at the bottom in just a minute about how we're going to be reaching out to you all and getting your feet, feedback. But it is, it is important to reemphasize that this is about improving the functionality of that gate. And there are a lot of people and a lot of different people that use that gate. Not only you as residents and as property owners, but you have employees, you have contractors, and you have these daily folks. Now, it's important to note, if you weren't aware, that we sell about 500,000 daily passes a year. So that is a lot of, a lot of folks that's coming, coming through that gate. So we had 980 people um, respond to the survey. For the right lane, that turned averaged about a 4% response rate to the survey. And to the left lane, interesting enough, it was a little bit less than half that. So there was a lower uh, percentage of those in the left lane that responded than, than the right lane. It is interesting to note that for this sample period, which was for the past month, that about 95% of those uh, that were purchasing daily passes or that stopped were in the proper lane. They were in the right lane, about 5% in the left lane. But go back to 500,000 daily passes and just, just do some simple math. So if you have 500,000 daily passes that you're selling a year, if only 5% are using the left lane, that's 25,000 people. So, you know, when you see these percentages, even if it's a small percentage, just due to the volumes that we're experiencing up there, it, it can, you know, throw a wrench into the gears to that, to that functionality. So this survey was primarily designed to, to look at signage and, and location and not only the, the signage itself, but the words that are on the signs to try to clarify some things that may not be, be clear now. So some raw data. Uh, this has not been analyzed by USCB. It is our intent to have it analyzed, and it may be something that may be appropriate uh, by the researcher once that analysis is complete to present to this group. So this is some raw data, so keep that in mind. The vast majority of people who entered, uh, entered for recreational reasons. It was about 90 percent, actually about 88 percent of those folks. About 11 percent were commercial or contractors. These were people that were purchasing daily passes. And almost 1% said that I or we did not mean to enter sea ponds. And 1% is not a big number, right? Well, 500,000, 1%, 5,000. I mean, these, these are thousands of people that on an annual basis are getting to the gate and not wanting to get to the gate. They then have to stop, make that determination. They then have to be turned around and so you, you get the experiences that you, that you have up there. The majority of the group, when asked to identify themselves, when given a list of words, right? Language is important. Uh, they identified themselves as visitors, okay? If you think about the words that you'll see on signage up there now, you'll see residents, guests, daily visitors, uh, property owners. You know, these things have different meanings to different people. I also wanted to emphasize at this time that, that this is the very group of people that took this current survey that we don't really have the ability to reach out to or to educate or inform, and they're not familiar. So if we were to change some language on signage up there, we could work with you all and communicate with you all so that you know where you're going. We can do the same with employees. We do the same with commercial contract people. We're able to touch at least once a year all these groups, these daily visitors. That's not the case. So these are the people that we really need to get to to help improve, if it can be improved, the functionality of the gate. Also interesting was that they, when given a list of choices, describe those that are able to use the left lane as pass holders. That's how they describe those folks. We are visitors, they are pass holders. Majority of the group entered Sea Pines via the Sea Pines Circle from Business 278. You can say, well, that's interesting, great. How's that useful? Well, it was over 50% from 278 business, entering Sea Pine Circle from 278 business. About 20% entered from Pope Avenue, and about 20% entered from Palmetto Bay Road. Well, why is this important? Well, if you add Pope Avenue, about 20%, to the folks that are using 278 business, about 75% of the people that are buying a daily pass when they exit the circle are in the left lane. Well, what does that mean? That means that they have a very short period of time in which they need to understand that they need to get into the right lane to purchase the daily pass. And as you know, that short corridor is short, and it's congested, and it's busy, and it's confusing. And so we need to see if there are things that we can do, things that are actionable in both the size of signs, the type of signs, the verbiage on the signs, that will help a lot of these folks understand better, I need to get over.
So that's that, and we'll have more information to come as the analysis is complete. We are going to reach out to you all. So we're going back to what we said earlier about 67% of you said it was very important or extremely important, specific to Greenwood Gate. We are working, Amanda and I, currently with USCB to develop a survey for you in which we hope to identify specific issues. And you'll notice that it doesn't specifically say Greenwood Gate, although we think that's where most of the issues are. But with this survey, we're going to look at both gates. And so we're going to try to identify as best we can what specific issues may be for both the Greenwood Gate and the Ocean Gate. And a few coffees ago, I had presented a list, and I did get some feedback. I appreciate it on specific issues that you experience as you go in and out of those gates. So what specifically is it? Is it something that we can, through planning, do something about? Can we try to mitigate it? Or is it something that's beyond our control? You know, if your biggest issue is the backup to the sea pine circle, our ability to influence that is much less than some of the other issues. Some of the issues could be you have a heck of a time getting out from Harris Teeter and taking that left to come in. You may have an issue as you're headed outbound with people that are headed inbound cutting across to go into Riley's or into Wells Fargo. Uh, bikes and pedestrian crossings, those or lack thereof, may be an issue. Um, so they're getting into club course. Maybe you want to be in the right lane because you live in club course, but the right lane's backed up, so you use the left lane. You use the left lane. As soon as you get in the gate, you have to do that combat merge to then turn on the club course drive. Coming out of club course, it can be an issue as well, so if you're headed left. So all of these issues we're trying to get a feel for, so again, we can get a better understanding of specifically what your issues are. So as we go into our planning process, we can try to make improvements so that the gate functions better for all, this, all the, that use it. All right, that's all I had, thank you. Oh, I had some forest preserve stuff, I'm not done. <laughs> So as Amanda said earlier, I was going to talk about these. We have a couple of events that you may or may not be aware of. We have our, and both of these are six annual events. We have our community yard sale on Saturday, October 15th. It is at the trolley lot off of Greenwood Drive. Uh, registration forms are available now. There are copies on the table. The space is $30 if you would like to participate. And then we have optional tables that we rent. If you'd like us to have tables waiting on you, those are optional and, and $10 a piece. Again, you can get them uh, on the website at CSA or have a copy here. If you have a lot of stuff that's built up over time, and we always do, this is a, a great way to, uh, to sell it. Um, in years past, we've probably averaged 1,500 or more uh, customers, if you will. So it's typically well attended and a great, a great community event. Uh, the signature event for the Forest Preserve, the bonfire, will be Friday, November 11th. Uh, that's from 4.30 to 7.30. Uh, tickets will be available starting October 3rd. Individual tickets are $75 uh, per person, same as uh, last couple years. You also have the option if you'd like to reserve a table for you and your guest uh, for eight. That's $750. And again, those will be available starting October 3rd. Now I'm really done. Thank you. Morning, everybody. How's everybody today? Good? Good. Um, I'll try to make this quick. I got a lot of stuff to get through. Um, but uh, all the good stuff and photos um, from the storm are at the uh, end of uh, the, the slides. Um, Amanda, if you could move forward to the next slide, please. Um, so I, I've, I've touched on the canvas back fence project a few times. Um, I, I realized that I had not shown the community a finished photo if you've not seen the uh, fence at uh, the Ocean Gate. Uh, I will say that uh, during the storm Friday, uh, while I was concerned with you know our, our property owners and, and our staff and uh, our, everybody's well-being, I, I, I will... I will uh, share the fact that this, this fence did cross my mind when there's, uh, you know, 15 and 20 trees that are uh, dropping in the community. I, uh, I, did, I did get a chance to drive by and, and peek and make sure that, uh, that it was safe. But uh, remarkable improvement from, uh, you can see what the before and afters are. Um, really, really turned out nice. We have some more landscaping to install. We, we had anticipated on doing that um, actually last week, and uh, our delivery from Savannah got delayed because of the storm. But uh, we're, we're trying to uh, get, that, get that wrapped up and finished up uh, this week or next. Uh, next slide. So on August 10th, I'm going to go in kind of reverse order. We had uh, a community outreach meeting uh, regarding our um, hydrology study and conditions assessments of all of our stormwater. 
uh, systems. So that's our lagoons, our pipes, our control structures, our catch basins. Um, you know, we we uh, hired an engineering firm in July to go go and do a, a deep dive of of our uh, stormwater system for the community um, to really grasp all of the potential issues with um, possible dredging, our pipes, our control structures. Um, it's an aging system, so for us, we wanted to be proactive and get out in front of any possible issues that we may have. At that community outreach meeting, we had a handful of property owners come. I, I wanted to thank thank you that, that are in attendance that did. Um, we also had a great deal of emails that were sent to us. Um, I think 30, Amanda, uh, 30 emails, and, and, and these were identifying areas where um, you all had told us that there were problems. So, you know, this this study that we're doing is, is to specifically get out and look at these areas, but look at the system as a whole to see and get recommendations of what we can do to, to, to better resolve it. Um, so I just wanted to share the, the map on the right-hand side is everything in blue. If you can't, it's kind of small print at the bottom. Has been completed and surveyed by the engineering firm. Everything in green is, uh, is going to be completed by the middle of November. And at the end of November, we will have a comprehensive uh, analysis uh, and recommendation for um, what our current state of our, our lagoons and um, stormwater system is in and um, pricing attributed to that so we can look at long-range planning and really put this in, in, in a long long-range plan um, so that's that's uh, that's the update on the uh, hydrology study uh, moving forward and this ties to this um, the town released their their budget numbers uh, for 2017, and um, since since me and, and my staff have been here, we've identified some projects that needed to um, be done that the town has budgeted for, and they are solely independently managing these projects for us, so it's not even a reimbursement, which is typically the case. The town is actually coordinating the efforts for these projects and um, doing them themselves. You know, there's we're, we're going to have oversight to make sure that, you know, it's, it's, it's adequate for the community, but, you know, that's four hundred thousand dollars of projects the town budgeted for us for uh, 2017 I think that's pretty phenomenal um, you know a lot of these are really important projects and you can see there uh, the Baynard Cove outfall repair spotted sandpiper ready turnstone duck hawk and ocean pipe upgrades which is complete so the top the top four are not complete um, but but we are uh, working with the town to get those schedules and get and, and get those completed um, next slide please so I, I touched on this about a year ago at a community coffee, and um, we've had, you know, I, here lately we haven't had many, but I think it was probably three or four weeks ago we had uh, some lagoon turnovers, um, and I was talking with the property owner at the administration building, and, and we'd kind of decided it was good to kind of reiterate this and, and just talk about it. Um, you know, lagoon, lagoon turnovers happen, and it's a pretty natural occurrence. Um, you know, our, our significant days that we had with... Um, Excessive heat, 90 degree plus temperatures, which I believe 68, 67 days, something like that was on the Savannah News. Um, you know, that heats up the lagoons in the system, and while we keep all of the gates open, um, the system's gravity fed. So it's, it's you know, we, we have flow coming in and out, but to keep everything emulsified and, and mixed is sometimes a challenge. So you have those extended periods of no rain and uh, high heat. You know, you can, you can have issues when you have thunderstorms or you have tidal activity where you have low light levels and no sunlight, or um, extreme heat in the upper strata of the lagoon. You'll have those inversions where the lagoon will turn over and the dissolved oxygen content will be depleted and you sometimes have fish kill. So um, really the, the fish kill and the turnover that we had probably three or four weeks ago was attributed to all the days of excessive heat and really no rain. Um, and and it's it's... I, interesting, you know, the, the time that I've been here, the, how these things correlate, and you know, it's it's uh, it's always after a, a real hard rainfall. So that, you know, three weeks ago we had a real hard rain is, is when we started having turnovers, which you know is makes sense to, you know, the, the the fresh water infiltration into the lagoon system. So I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, as a part of you next slide, please, as a part of. Um, <clears throat> That communication to the community and, and, and just letting you know that, that why turnovers happen, it's a pretty natural thing, but also as a part of our um, hydrology study that, that we're um, working on now with our engineering firm, you know, a lot of these recommendations that we get from them um, will hope, hopefully, and, and, and the goal is to obviously 
first and foremost, make sure the community is safe, right? And, and um, property values are protected and, and, and personal lives are protected from our stormwater system, but also to um, the aesthetical side, which is, you know, help curtail some of those uh, turnover issues and get some recommendations from, them, from the engineers to um, help, help offset that. So that's really, um, I'm not going to go through every single bullet, but there's uh, some preventative turnover measures that, uh, you know, dredging is one of them, uh, plant buffers, agitators, those are just some off the top of my head. But, um, you know, hopefully we can get some of those recommendations from, from our engineering firm. Uh, next slide. So the Hermine, um, myself and my staff um, had a, a really long weekend. Um, we've had a lot of uh, good emails from the community as regards to, um, you know, thanking the staff. I just want to put out there if you see any of the maintenance staff. Um, this was a, a conjointed effort with not only maintenance of sea pines, but also um, Ocean Woods Landscape. And, you know, we were working very intricately with, with security and Toby. I, I thank him for his staff, you know, being on the ball and helping us coordinate um, all of the lane closures and road closures that we needed to do to be able to get some of these trees cleaned up. It was, uh, it, it, as Toby said, it was, uh, you know, it seemed, seemed like as soon as we get, would get one cleaned up, it, it would be, you know, five minutes later we'd get a call and uh, we'd have another one down. So it was just one right after another all day Friday. I actually found myself with a chainsaw in my hand, which, which uh, my guys like seeing. Um, you know, it's nice for me to get out and work with them, but it, 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 uh, it was kind of all hands on deck. We called all of our staff uh, back from vacation, um, and anybody that, that it was available was, was here working uh, Friday through Monday. So um, if you see them in the community, thank them. You know, they worked hard. We took care of them this weekend, fed them, you know, um, um, really, you know, gave them, gave them high remarks, but uh, it, was, it was challenging in the regard that, uh, you know, it, it, it just, uh, the prolonged winds, which weren't terrible, you know, tropical storm, not, not hurricane uh, level, um, definitely created some problems for us in the community. And, um, you know, we, from a cleanup effort, really focused on those hazardous trees first and anything that was um, on on property or, or damaged private property, we, we, we tried to collect as much information as we could. If it was out of town um, property owners, we, we notify them to let them know that they have an issue that, that needs to be looked at. Um, we cleaned all the leisure trails and really tried to get out and identify any safety hazards hanging above our heads. So this is where, you know, I ask for the community's help. If you see anything, please call our administration office talk to Denise, get a work order in the system for us to go out and take a look at, look at those areas, and then we'll schedule uh, accordingly with our, with our contractors that do some of our um, more technical tree removal work, um, climbing, uh, those types of things. If we have trees that fall, we obviously can take care of that internally, but you know, some of those highly more technical uh, removals and, and limbs that are hanging you know, 80 and 90 feet up, we contract out. But, um, you know, and then really, we've been moving forward to get roads clear and clean. Um, all the debris that was on the roads, you know, if we had a rainstorm now, you know, a two or three inch uh, soaking event, um, with all that debris on the roads, where do you think it's going to go? It's going to go right into the drain and we're going to have, uh, you know, street flooding and problems with that. So really the focus was emergency, uh, you know, high level tree removals, then um, at road clearing to, to prevent any potential uh, flooding that we may have if we had a, a substantial rain. Then really it's just beautification cleanup. Uh, open space and um, you know just getting all the stuff picked up but um, it's uh, it's 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 been challenging we're making strides it's uh, there's a lot more to do but um, you know just be patient with us debris pickups we're we're actively doing but there's just so much debris to pick up in the community um, we are a little little behind but we're, um, we're we're working to get all that done for you so that's all I got I think thank you Yeah, I'd like to take just a couple minutes before we break to thank Bo and his crew, Toby and his crew, Amanda and David. They really put in a lot of hours over the weekend and got communications out. And by and large, you know, I know everybody's got specific circumstances out there, but I think by and large the response from the community as well as I drove around Saturday morning, I couldn't believe how many people in the community were out picking up their yards and cleaning things up and creating piles for Bo to pick up later. 
<laughs> but the guys did a great job. Amanda, David, thank you very much, and uh, certainly appreciate it. With that, I'd like to take just three to five minutes, have some coffee. And those of you who would like to go ahead and exit, go ahead and exit, and then we'll be back for Q&A. Yes, sir. My question is about the removal of sizable trees from property. Yesterday morning, I arrived at our community garden to uh, uh, restore a fence and a gate that had blown down and uh, observed an altercation underway between a CSA employee and a volunteer over a removal of a tree that had fallen across our fence onto the grass beside the uh, canal. And uh, the final upshot was uh, the tree is on CSA property, but you own the tree, so it's your removal. And I, I didn't understand that. I understand that uh, this is a sizable tree that you're not going to lift with two people. It had been cut in sections. But uh, uh, the garden doesn't own the property either, so uh, <laughs> the, so the question is, uh, who's responsible for the removal of sizable trees? Okay, let me just go ahead. Go ahead, Bo. Hi, sir. I, I think the the tree that you're referencing is the tree in the Heritage Farm. Um, that, that tree actually in that property belongs, belongs to the resort, and I spoke to uh, Kerry Corbett, the Vice President of Operations for the resort. They are, he has committed to me that they're going to get that tree removed. Um, so the, the tree did split. Half of it fell into our open space over the fence and into the lagoon. Our maintenance staff removed that. The half that fell into the Heritage Farm is going to be removed by the resort because that is their property. We had that removed on Saturday. Good. I'm glad yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That that's pretty standard for all. You know, we're we're going to remove trees from CSA property, and individual property owners remove their own trees from their properties. We're we're not a contractor to do those things. There are contractors available to remove those trees. The golf courses, all of those property owners have their own responsibilities for cleanup, just as you as a homeowner have your responsibility for your property to clean up. Other questions? Yes, sir. It isn't a, Sue Emke, it isn't a, a question. It's actually a suggestion that was made, and I forgot about it, so I thought I'd tell you now because I'll forget about it at the next committee meeting. Uh, this is Club Course Drive going, trying to get out to, through the gate. Yes. And uh, the woman that told me she was happened to be behind two people who didn't know there's a turning lane. Right. And, you know, she watched them go around. She suggested, like, striping, white, white striping that leads to the turning lane so people can know there's a turning lane there. Okay. That's we, can, we can take a look at it, see what we can uh, uh, come up with. You're, you're right, though. There's people that sit there and don't know they have a safe lane to turn out to. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great suggestion. We'll take a look at that. Other questions, suggestions? Hi, Sheila Ferguson. On the trolley stats, is that I couldn't help when I look, I live off of Greenwood Drive and see pines. Um, so I, I see a lot of trolleys. In the last month, though, it's like I, I literally saw at least 20 empty trolleys, and I saw a handful of people, you know, no, no more than probably seven trolleys that had more than two people in it. And so my question is, is that I got the volumes, but shouldn't you be looking at the volumes by day or by month to actually make sure that um, the expenses that we invest in that are prudently spent? Absolutely. And we do, you know, one of the great things that we did to get that information was to put the systems in place. And last year, we dramatically changed our routes. And I'll let Toby speak more about the reporting and how we changed it. But we changed to get our uh, ridership up on those trolleys. And as you can see from the numbers, we did get the ridership up. But we're not done. 
okay, we're going to look at this year again and see what those volumes are and try to use those trolleys the best that we can so that we can get people where they're going without, you know, having empty trolleys riding around the, the plantation. But, Toby? Yeah, we did, uh, just for example, from the trolley lot there off of Greenwood on the power lines. Um, last year, that trolley started at 10 a.m. in the morning, and that trolley kind of set. We had very little activity. That got moved back to 4 p.m. this year. So that trolley didn't start running until 4 o'clock. So there is, you, you're exactly right, there is times during the day where we have some empty trolleys, but then you get to a Friday evening when Greg Russell's playing and I need five more trolleys because we're just, we're so full. So we are, we're gonna go back with the committee to take a look at the schedule uh, to see where we need to make changes at. It just, where, where we get called at is that we publicize the, the routes in advance. And the resort sends that out, and everyone is expecting the trolley to run. So if we're like, okay, there's no one, we're going to shut the trolleys down. Well, then the telephone ring, where's the trolleys at? So, but we are going to go back and take a look at the numbers to see where the pickups and drop off were, and if we can adjust the schedules, that's what we're going to do. Because you're obviously right, it does save money. Yes, ma'am. Is there any consideration to actually giving that back to the resort since they're the primary beneficiary rather than having the residents subsidize that? I would love to give it to someone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, no, it provides a great service. I, that's, I, that's beyond my pay grade. No. Uh, Sue? Then we'll, come here. well, just, uh, I mean, the resort can publish the schedule but can't like everybody else, put in a disclaimer, uh, routes subject to change, you know. Sure, you know, but still, uh, again, you know, we, we're, we're trying to give people information to make decisions in advance. So if they want to plan on a trolley ride during a certain time, we want to do the best to provide that trolley uh, ride as we've committed to it. But we do change it. We canceled the trolleys on Friday because of storm damage and the, the storm coming in. If there are issues that are uh, out there, we will. And we're certainly, as Toby mentioned, we're gonna readjust our schedules as we go forward on that and try to use these uh, trolleys for the purpose that we think they're for, which is to minimize cars and provide people access to the commercial areas where there may be limited parking. Oh, right here. Um, my question is for Amanda or David. When you did the um, survey, of daily visitors. Did you ask any questions about the what the visitors intended to do when they came into Sea Pines? I think one of the concerns that the owners and the residents have is that we're experiencing a huge increase in daily visitors and we're not quite sure how much they add to the commercial interests, what they spend, what they do here, and how much they detract from the quality of our lives by coming in not realizing that they need they don't need to stop for bicyclers and all sorts of things. So did you ask any questions related to those issues? That's a great question. We were limited on the number of questions we could ask because it was a mobile survey that we completed. Um, we asked what their primary reason for coming into Sea Pines was. So that was a number of different categories. David briefly touched on it. One of them was, I didn't mean to come to Sea Pines. So we had some numbers on those people who didn't have any intention on coming. And then we broke it into two separate categories. We broke it into recreational reasons. So that is somebody who would be coming to support commercial entities, essentially, from what we gathered from the statistics, because that was the largest percentage of those individuals individuals who responded. Recreational. Recreational. And then the other breakdown was CSA, um, was contract, excuse me, not CSA, but contractors, the, anybody else who wouldn't need or would not already have a pass broke into the other group. So we just broke it into recreational because we were limited on how many questions we had specifically for this um, I think, survey. I think that topic, that topic of what are day visitors are doing here right. and how much they're spending and what they're adding and taking away from our community would be a great okay. topic to explore in the future. Absolutely, certainly something that we can put on the docket as well because um, that would be a good idea for us to know where they're going and what they're doing when they're in the plantation after they come behind the gates. So certainly something we can consider. Thank you. Yes, sir. And Gary James. Uh, just to clarify, we sell the guest passes, right? 
So we have to take care of our visitors. We CSA. CSA sells the pass, yes. Other questions? Okay. Well, great. Thank you for coming. Remember, next meeting is at 5.30 in the afternoon. As I was corrected, I thought it was evening, but Amanda tells me that's afternoon. So.